collaboration with the Cyprus Mail. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambos. Coming up this week, journalist and author Michael Jansen launches her new book inspired by the 2011 Egyptian Revolution. They were peaceful, they were attacked by the government. 846 people were killed and they stood their ground. Sometimes they had to fight back, but they were welcoming and friendly and it was a great experience. A new app aims to improve our driving. You can see how you drive and how to improve your driving. The government plans to lure filmmakers to the island. Cyprus is actually going to offer the highest incentives of any other European Union country. And St Paul's Anglican Cathedral gets a new stained glass window. We meet the artist who created it. I tell people it's just colouring in and jigsaw puzzles. It's just how good do you want to be at the end of the day? And that's where the stress comes in. On Wednesday evening at the CVAR in Old Nicosia, there was a book launch. The book, Windows on Interesting Times, is by Michael Jansen. And she joins us now. Michael, I have to start by asking about your name, because it's most unusual to have a lady called Michael and not Michaela or something. Well, my parents had different excuses for giving me this name. It all wound, wound down eventually to the fact that my mother had a favourite film actress who was married to John Barrymore and who took the name of Michael Strange. And so I ended up with the name Michael. Has it been difficult through your life, that? It has been, on, uh, on occasion, quite difficult. Actually, I wrote for the Irish Times for a certain number of months and everybody thought I was a man. Let's talk about your work as a journalist first before we get on to the book because I suspect that the window on interesting times is very much due to the life you've led, mostly in the Middle East, I think, and now in Cyprus, and seen a lot of, well, very different things going on. So tell us a little bit about your journalistic career. Well, I um, studied uh, politics, actually, at university and then I, as an undergraduate, then I went to the American University of Beirut and studied more politics and I also worked in Beirut and I edited books and edited a journal and then I did some journalism off and on, rather freelance kind of journalism. I also wrote regularly for something called Middle East International which was published in London. And in 1987, I joined the Irish Times as a Middle East analyst and have been going at it ever since. And also, my husband was a journalist, so it was in the family. And he used to write for The Economist of London. And he also wrote for an Indian paper. And then I also do columns for The Jordan Times and the paper in the United Arab Emirates called The Gulf Today. So you've got a lot of experience in Middle East politics and living there must have also given you a slightly different take on things because it's quite difficult to really grasp what people are feeling if you're not among them, isn't it? Well, the point is my view of what a journalist should do is to report events as straightforwardly as possible and to speak to the people to see what their views are and not impose my views. Now, I, of course, I do opinion stuff as well, but I don't try to put my opinions in my reporting. So my aim has always been to tell the story the way the people themselves saw it. And I lived in Beirut for 14 years, and I've lived in Cyprus for 42 years. <laughs> <laughs> so you've written also about the Cyprus issue? Yes, I've written a novel called The Aphrodite Plot, and I wrote a book about the theft of antiquities following the Turkish invasion called War and Cultural Heritage. And you wrote The Battle for Beirut. And I wrote The Battle for Beirut, which was about the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982, 
and I wrote a book about the Israeli peace movement, which was called Dissonance in Zion, which was published in London. So you've got a lot of experience in this area. Now let's move to the book that was launched earlier this week, Windows on Interesting Times. You've probably had so many interesting times. I wonder how many windows you needed in the book to include the best ones. Well, I didn't uh, look for best ones. The book, well, it is called Windows on Interesting Times because the title comes from a Chinese curse called May You Live in Interesting Times. Now, as I say, the curse is what is important. And I tried to tell stories of the people of the Middle East and their events in the book. And I started out in Tahrir Square in Cairo in 2011 during the Egyptian Revolution. And I proceeded from there, but following my chain of thought. So the book is not a chronological exposition of what happened or a narrative. Everything is mixed up. But there are um, specific uh, sort of headlines which uh, stories are grouped under. But as I say, you will find a story from 1993 next to a story from... 1967. It's all mixed up. But the point is, I have also done what journalists do when they send in their stories to newspapers. I put the date lines on so you can identify where the stories are and the time that they are fixed into. And some of them presumably are, have nothing to do with some of the others. So Yes, I mean, they, they do, to try to tell the story of the Middle East with all the different problems that it has and all the different countries would be almost impossible. be a very long book, yeah, too. It would be a very, this could be a much longer book because I have a lot more stories. But um, the whole idea is to give an impression. It's an impressionist book. It's not a history. It's not a biography. It is an impressionist book. So you have used journalistic tricks in a way, but you're putting them in with your opinion. No, I, I, I tried not to put any opinion in. In ah. this book, I have stayed away from opinion. I have just tried to describe the events and tell what the people think. When I write opinion pieces for newspapers, that's a different story. Okay, but books are also a different story, aren't they? Yes, books are a different story. I mean, they're a narrative very often. And this must be a narrative. It is a that. narrative, but everything is all mixed up. You must have so much material. Are you preparing another book? No. <laughs> when I wrote the last one, I said, that's it. And then I wrote this one. Oh, well, there you are. So you probably will write another one. What, what is it that actually pushes you to, well, in a sense, you can't say pick up the pen anymore. I presume it's all done on yeah, a computer, on computer. But in effect, pick up the pen and say, oh, yes, I need to do that one. Well, this one... I think it was mandated by my experience in Tahrir Square, which was one of the greatest experiences I've had so far in this part of the world. Because you had Egyptians from all walks of life, all backgrounds, all incomes in this square, all pushing for the removal of the president who had been there for 30 years and demanding bread, freedom and justice. And they were peaceful, they were attacked by the government. 846 people were killed. And they stood their ground. Sometimes they had to fight back. But they were welcoming and friendly, and it was a great experience. And uh, any journalist who had been in Tahrir Square during those days in January 2011, February 2011, was most impressed with the people. The eldest person in the square was 97. She was nearly blind and deaf, and I had met her in my first trip to the Middle East in 1961. And I interviewed her two years later and, had, uh, and got her whole story, which was fantastic. I mean, these are the kind of stories I've been trying to tell in the book, the stories of the people. I mean, she was the daughter of an, a pasha who was under the British rule. And he was also in charge of public works. 
And when she was a young girl, uh, he had refused to let her go to university. He wanted to, her to get married and have children. She refused to get married. She never did. After he had died, she had gone to university, got her M.A., and, but she made a life for herself working with a charity which looked after children with tuberculosis. Fantastic stories. And you're still travelling? Are you going back to any of these places no, in I the just, coming months? I just came from Jordan a few days ago. So I still travel. I've been to Syria this year. I try to go to Syria two, three times a year. So I've only been once, so I have to try to go again. And we have to talk about some of those trips another time. Michael, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Good luck with Windows on Interesting Times, which was launched this week in Nicosia at the CVAR. If you'd like a copy, Google it, look for it online, or go along to Salonian Bookshop in Nicosia or contact Rimal Publishers in Limassol. A new mobile app was launched earlier this week by General Insurance of Cyprus. It's called Drive Safe, and the chairman of General Insurance joins us to explain what it's all about and why they thought it was necessary. He is Aristos Stiliano. Aristos, tell us why you thought that this was something we needed in Cyprus. Okay, Cypriot drivers, even though, even though they think they're the best in the world, they sometimes overdo it in the use of the mobile, uh, speeding, harsh braking, fast acceleration. And we wanted to offer something to society as an insurance company, not only to our customers, to, to offer them an application which values or um, assesses their driving behavior. These telematic applications are quite common in the UK and in Italy. And there are a new thing that's coming into the market, and that's basically that. It um, assesses your driving ability. It uh, uses uh, four or five parameters. The one is how fast you go, how often and at what speed you're over the limit, the use of your mobile telephone, because everybody knows that when you're driving and using the mobile, you don't concentrate as much as you should be, um, harsh accelerations, and harsh braking. So all these parameters are evaluated by the census of the application, and they give you a grade. They give you a number from zero to 100. The nearer you are to 100, the safer driver you are. It does it on every journey if you yes. put it on, I guess. Yeah. But it's also giving an awful lot of your data, isn't it? Right. Where you are, what time of day it okay. is. Is it not invasive, intrusive? Um, well, in a world now of uh, GDPR, all these regulations about the sensitive personal data and the rest, we were extremely careful not to retain any of that information. All the information kept by the providers is anonymized. So nobody knows. You're just a number to them. They keep the data of a number and they don't know who the number is. So your data is safe. You're the only person that has access to know exactly what you're doing. Neither general insurance nor the provider knows who you are and what your data is. We just get a number. We don't know your trips. We don't know your, how often you used it. it it's anonymized. And uh, actually, that was the biggest uh, issue we had because being a member of the Bank of Cyprus group, we were extremely sensitive on, on data, and we had to go through all the procedures to make sure that we were not violating or being intrusive or being overdoing it in collecting data that wasn't necessary. Right. Now then, let's look at the speeding thing, for example. We don't yet really have smart roads in Cyprus. No, we don't. So a lot of the stuff that you see on European roads and in new European cars doesn't actually work here mm -hmm. because it doesn't recognize road signs, traffic signs and that okay. sort of thing. So how does this do that? We, had to, we don't have the data out there in Cyprus, do but we? But there is data on speed limits. When you're driving... You get on your mobile and on these new modern cars, the speed limit of that particular strip of road, it, it's identified. You get signals. So your car and the mobile application knows whether you're in a 60-kilometer zone or a 100-kilometer zone. 
and then the application assesses if you're on a motor when you're above the limit, it knows that. So th that information we get, we, we, we still don't get that information that you get in European countries, whether there are traffic signs or road bumps or information, one-way streets, we don't get that. But actually, in Cyprus, most of the roads, you know the speed limit. One of the other things that struck me at the presentation was that it says that you lose points for driving between midnight and 5 a.m., yes. which apparently have been assessed as the most dangerous yes. hours. But that means that, for example, if you happen to need to drive to the airport to pick somebody up during those hours, your score is going to go down. Uh, no, it doesn't actually go down, but it recognises the, the time you're driving. And from midnight to 5 o'clock in the morning, statistically, it's a time when most accidents uh, occur. So it keeps a record of your driving pattern during those hours. Yeah, but you lose marks no, in the, the you, sense you, that we, we didn't explain that all of this data is put together to give you a score, yes. which you then, I think, as an insurance company, may use to say, OK, you qualify for a discount. OK. Every trip is evaluated. You get, you got a mark, a, a number, uh, which evaluates all these parameters, speed, um, use of mobile, harsh braking, harsh acceleration, the hours you use, and, and, and you get the number. If you're driving between midnight and five, you, you don't get as many points for the same trip as you would have got if it was six o'clock in the afternoon. That mark then, it, it's kept, you, you're aware of it, and what we're planning to do in the next uh, couple of um, upgrades is to, if of course you want, to link it to your own insurance policy, and the better you're driving, the better your marks, and the bigger the discount we will give you on renewal. So if you are a four-star driver, which is if, you, if your um, grades are more than 80%, which means you are in the top 20% drivers, then you will get on renewal a 20% or a 10% or a 5% discount on your uh, policy fees. So in a way, we will, we're rewarding the good drivers. Now, it doesn't require an internet connection to work, but it does use up a fair amount of the battery of your mobile if it's being used while you're driving? Well, n n not that much. Uh, from stat When we did our uh, research and testing, I, th I think it takes about 1% of your battery per day if it's not in use. If you haven't driven and you have it on, it's about 1%. And if you're actually using, it's about 3% of the battery per hour of, of, of driving. From our experience, it's not a prohibitive factor. You, you don't even notice it because we normally charge them. We've got our um, charges in the car, so it, 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 will, it will not make any big difference. OK, and you talk about the use of telephones while you're driving. Yeah. We all know that you see people daily in Cyprus, oh, yeah. hundreds of them, yep. chatting away, not hands-free. Mm -hmm. What about people who've got Bluetooth in their car or it's hands-free? I know that you said earlier, and it, it is proven, that just talking on even yep. a hands-free phone takes your brain slightly away from the junction ahead or the yep. guy behind. But generally speaking, as long as it's hands-free and you're being reasonably careful, yep. are you going to say to people you shouldn't do that either? No, if you're using your Bluetooth or if you're hands-free and your hands are on the wheel, it, it, it doesn't affect your concentration so you don't get penalised. What you get penalized for is when you're actually holding the mobile, you're punching in numbers, you're reading messages, then that affects your concentration. So the app can see that you're doing the that? The app, yes. The sensor of the app knows if you're holding the app and if the, if the mobile is being used and it's moving around. If you just put your mobile on next to your chair and there's an incoming call and you've got Bluetooth and it's hands-free, it's like listening to the radio. You're still concentrating, you're still driving properly, your hands are on the wheel and, 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 and it's fine. But once there's an incoming call, you pick up the mobile to see who's calling you, then that's already distracted. Your attention has gone out of the window. Uh, then you want to ring somebody, so you go through your contacts, you're choosing a number, you're ringing. All these things are sensed by the application and you get penalised for it. Who are you hoping is going to make use of this? I mean, DriveSafe 
obviously it should be all motorists. Yeah. I can see that some people might like to assess how much petrol they're wasting with heavy braking mm -hmm. and heavy acceleration and stuff like that. Yeah. And I can possibly see that the competitiveness of having a good score yeah. might make people feel good. But do you really think that most Cypriot drivers are going to get this so that they can see how damned awful they really <laughs> are? Sorry. I hope so, because statistically and with tests on uh, telematic applications, there's a 20% improvement in your driving. It's very strange, but since I got the, the app and I'm using it, I behave better in the roads. I don't speed because there is this constant somebody telling you that you're over the limit. The mobile use... Does it tell you you're over the limit when you're speeding? No, no. no tell just... you at, at the end of the trip, okay. and actually there are maps and they can tell you exactly where you speed. So basically what you're saying is it should make drivers yes. more aware and perhaps motivate them to yeah, improve. Definitely. And that's our contribution to, to society in a way, an attempt to reduce accidents and make Cypriots drive better. Okay, that's the uh, mobile app called Drive Safe. Where can people get it? Stores. App stores. App stores, uh, Amazon. It, it works on all smartphones. It's, it's free to download from the app stores. So and it doesn't, it just needs your, uh, we don't want any details, it's extremely easy to, to download. We only need your email. Just put your email, you will get um, a password which is uh, just for you and uh, from then it's easy. You can see how you drive and how to improve your driving. And that is Aristos Silianou, chairman of the General Insurance of Cyprus, talking about the Drive Safe app. It's available for smartphones, iPhones, Androids, whatever. Just look in the App Store or Google Play. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambis. Earlier this week, there was a high level conference entitled the Cyprus Film Summit. It's the move by the government to attract filmmakers to our lovely island. Well, among all the keynote speakers, there was also a panel discussion on filming in Cyprus. One of the panellists was television production consultant Munro Forbes. He joins us now. Munro, what would you say was the outcome of the summit and the feedback that you got during the panel discussion and the Q&A? The feedback was very encouraging because there were people from all over the world here for this summit and they were shown marvellous video showing what the country can offer. But the summit concentrated on the benefits, financial benefits, on offer now to try to kick-start the film industry here in Cyprus. There's a, a long way to go to catch up on countries like Malta who have been making films for 50 years but at least now there's a determination by the government and the private sector to actually make this happen. So lots of questions from people from America, from India, from Europe about how the incentives program will work, how it will work for them and whether their um, planned productions that they intend to shoot in the next few months in Cyprus will qualify. It's going to be very good, is it not, for people in the industry in Cyprus, because I presume that when companies come from abroad, although maybe they bring their stars and their lighting people and so on with them, they do need to hire people from the place itself to fill out all those other jobs. Exactly, and that, uh, these questions were raised from the floor today. They want to know just how many trained people exist in this country. And of course, small country... There are never going to be the numbers of trained people that exist in other uh, larger European countries or even in Malta, but at least it's a start and at least the existing film production people and television people here in Cyprus will get the opportunity to work on much bigger productions with much bigger budgets, many more demands. This will definitely filter through the whole industry in this country and I'm sure the benefits will be enormous. And we do have some very talented people in the industry right here in Cyprus. 
Yes, and I can only see it's going to be an enormous benefit to them to get an opportunity to work together, work on other people's productions as well, and to also increase uh, the opportunities for their own productions to be made in Cyprus. And hopefully, uh, Cypriot films might well get a much more exposure and get a much bigger audience. And what about the financial incentives? Because as you keep mentioning Malta, I mean, that is well known as a leader in the industry, and they put this front and forward many, many years ago and attracted huge amounts of film productions and, and so on to Malta. It's going to take us a while to catch up, but are the financial incentives sufficient? I believe they are because Cyprus is actually going to offer the highest incentives of any other European Union country. So we will be offering higher incentives than Malta. Of course, we don't have quite the same facilities at this stage. We don't have any film studios of any scale, and we don't have film tanks for water shoots and so on. But that could well come. You know, if, if these incentives can encourage big companies to come here and shoot, and today someone from America, from Los Angeles, was talking about a $21 million production, I wanted to know what benefits there would be in bringing this to Cyprus. So, you know, it will only take, I believe anyway, that if we can just encourage one or two people to come and do something on such a scale, the doors will open and many others would follow. Do you think that if it starts to take off, then it's up to the government to build the infrastructure of the things you've just mentioned, for example, or should that be left to the private sector? I think it would be best left to the private sector with full backing from the government. What does that mean? Perhaps some, in, some, um, some benefits could be offered by the government, some tax rebates, some, some encouragement to Cypriot private sector to actually invest in equipment, which is lacking in the country so far, and certainly in studio facilities. So it's looking good for the Cyprus film industry following this week's Cyprus Film Summit. And that was Munro Forbes, television production consultant, who was one of the panellists at the event. A new stained glass window was recently inaugurated in St Paul's Cathedral in Nicosia. It was part of the celebrations for the cathedral's 125th anniversary. And the window was designed and made by my next guest on the programme. From Lou in Cornwall and one-offs stained glass, she is Cathy Wilson. Cathy, how did you get involved in stained glass creations? Because somebody just mentioned that you hadn't actually studied and trained at well, it. Well, I'd been ill for a long time in London, so I decided I'd rather be on a beach. And then I moved to Cornwall. And then I realised to get back into work, I'd have to be self-employed. So I just did a little night class and just knew from the first piece of glass that I cut that that's what I was going to do. And then did the sort of the hobby levels of it. And then I turned it into a business and taught myself all the restoration work. So it must be fascinating because there are lots of different techniques involved, aren't oh, there? Oh, God, it's and endless. I, yeah, endless. I know that in the old days they used to use lead. They but still that's... use lead. Everything's leaded. Is and it? the cement's got lead base to it as well. And some of the paints have lead in it, so it's fairly toxic. <laughs> so tell us about how you go about creating something like the window in St Paul's. I presume that when it's commissioned, they give you an idea of what they want, and then what, do you come up with a design or a choice of designs? Mostly I'm left with a free reign, but I usually have sort of a, pro a project that I have to aim for, like I was told it had to be St Paul. So then I just do, did a very quick sketch of an idea, and then I went from there once I started making it. How long did it take you to make? About four months in total. But you also do, I think, accept commissions from people in private homes, oh, for I example. Oh, I do all sorts, all sorts. I do lots of private commissions. I work for the churches as well. I do listed buildings. I mean, technically, a window is just a window, whether it's in a church or a house. What's your favourite thing that you've ever done? I don't know. I don't know if I have a favourite. Um, each major piece of work I've done has been a challenge in its own right. 
and it's had its own stresses in its own right, and at the moment, it's this one. But this one now was very well received when it was unveiled in Nicosia. It was, and the church was just amazing. They just really looked after me, and it was great. You travelled out with it, I think, on your lap on the plane? Part of it, the small bit I did. The rest of it, I built a great big frame around it and used building insulation stuff and tons of duct tape and, yeah, about 16 layers of bubble wrap and, yeah. And yeah. you're going back now to what? A lot of restoration work that's been building up in the workshop, so I'll do that through the winter. And when you say restoration work, you're restoring Bu- windows? Buckets of broken windows, basically. Yes, res- restoration work. Whether it's boxes of broken windows all, all in bits or... How can you tell what they looked like, or do you not often have but a photo? Sometimes they have a photo, and other times I can just tell by what's left. A bit like doing a jigsaw puzzle. That's exactly what, and I tell people it's just colouring in and jigsaw puzzles. It's just how good do you want to be at the end of the day, and that's where the stress comes in. OK, but people can see your work online, I think. They what, can. What's your website? Uh, com. One offs stained glass.com. And we've been talking to Kathy Wilson, who's designed the latest window in St. Paul's Anglican Cathedral in Nicosia. Well, that about wraps up this edition of the Cyprus News Digest. Many thanks for your company. Hope you'll join me next week. Till we meet again, take care and God bless. Bye-bye now.